you do think microorganisms pose a threat? Or in the most dire terms. Not bacteria, not viruses, so... Fungus, because there are some fungi who seek not to kill, but to control. Viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds, telling it where to go, what to do, like a puppeteer with a marionette. It keeps its puppet alive by preventing decomposition and taking control, not of millions of us, but billions of us. Billions of puppets with poisoned minds permanently fixed on one unifying goal, to spread the infection to every last human alive by any means necessary. No cures, they don't exist, it's not even possible to make them. So if that happens... We're not sick! We're not sick. How did you get this? What if I told you that after we gave you some medicine, we're gonna find you your favorite food to eat? You're safe. seluruh kota dan seluruh orang yang ada di dalamnya. We lose. Before we get started, yes, I had already covered The Last of Us Cordyceps Brain Infection four years ago, but with the HBO series faithfully adapting the hit zombie game, I figured maybe it's time to do the first remake slash remaster of the Why You Wouldn't Survive series, since The Last of Us likes doing that frequently anyways. When I first heard that HBO was adapting The Last of Us for a TV show audience, I was a bit hesitant, especially when I saw articles discussing something that worried me from a Why You Wouldn't Survive standpoint. A big determinant factor of how millions of people, or at least remnants of people after the initial chaos would get infected with the fungus was the fact that it would create airborne spores that when inhaled would invade a host body and turn them into runners, meaning you needed to be donning gas masks and be well prepared or else even breathing meant you were doomed. But Neil Druckmann had stated that spores would be omitted from this adaptation for a different take on how the cordyceps spread. I was extremely hesitant to take away that crucial element, but with that being said, we are going to discuss the apocalypse of this restructured zombie outbreak. Don't say that. What? That. What? That. The Z word. Don't say it. And yes, I am calling them zombies. And yes, they are technically infected, or if you really want to call them fungal freddies, but it's within the genre, so bite me or don't, especially in this case. Today, we are discussing the gluten-free will inherit the earth. You don't think it's a little ridiculous that wheat protein is toxic? This whole thing was a setup, man. Maybe Papa John can help us. If we can get a hold of him, then maybe- There's a fungus among us. Halo fans are weeping at what faithful video game live action adaptations can be like, taking pot shots at the 28 Days Later franchise. Then who picked the first person? Was it a monkey? I bet it was a monkey. It wasn't a monkey. I thought you went to school. What? Cordyceps mutated. Some of it got into the food supply. It makes more sense than monkeys. Whoever they hire to play Abby for season two should stay offline, or at least away from Twitter. Today, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive the Last of Us HBO series zombie apocalypse. To not retread too much ground, we must first discuss the origin point of the outbreak, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, commonly known as the zombie ant fungus, basically acting as a parasite that feeds on living organisms, only insects and arachnids in our current world, and uses them to reproduce and flourish. By flooding the mind with hallucinogens, Ophiocordyceps can hijack the mind of a host. Most famously, and the inspiration for the series, was the case of the bullet ant in South America, where the fungus directs the ant to go upwards to 
a high place, but is immediately displaced by healthy ants, who basically quarantine him up high on the jungle trees. This poor insect eventually dies due to the fungus shutting down all major organs and using the body to reproduce and grow as fungi tend to like dining on stationary, dead, decaying organisms. As David Attenborough had to correct that from my last video because the comments won't let me live that down for mixing up Richard and David, describes, The more numerous a species becomes, the more likely it will be attacked by its nemesis, a cordyceps fungus with ants being the numerous target for their acquisition. However, what if the fungus found its way into the most dominant mammal on Earth? Reaching above 7 billion Homo sapiens, the fungus could mutate to thrive in the bodies of humans. As discussed in a 1968 intellectual talk show, Dr. Newman and Dr. Schoenheis brought up the idea of any number of fungus and how, if they made the transition to humans, how catastrophic and unopposed its outbreak would be. The looming threat of global warming raising temperatures causing fungi to adapt to hotter conditions. Currently, fungi cannot survive in bodies with internal temperatures of up to 94 degrees. But with evolution and mutation, life's adaptation to extreme conditions, well, that can all change. The fungus can and will adapt. there will be no kind of cure, preventative, or vaccine that could be made to fight it. Only destruction would be its cure. Now, how could something that exclusively attacks specific insect hosts make the massive leap to Homo sapiens basically overnight? Well, in my original video, I brought up the idea that agricultural crops being grown in places like South America may have suddenly been infested with the fungus, specifically a widely consumed product like cacao or chocolate. While putting the material through the cooking process would basically kill off the fungi, but you know what? This time around, chocolate isn't the source. No, we have something more widely consumed by the global public, being the fourth most exported food product in the world, wheat, a perfect substrate for Ophiocordyceps to process through. Originating from the world's largest flour milling plant in Jakarta, Indonesia, an average of 4 million tons of wheat products are processed through the Southeast Asian country, as exported wheats and grains would be wholly infested with the mycelium. Anyone that consumed any products made from wheat would unknowingly be vectors of the cordyceps, while diseases and normal fungi are normally eradicated during cooking and processing, the cordyceps' adaptation to global climate change and heat resistance would allow it to bypass this safety measure. At its point of origin in Jakarta, Professor of Mycology Ratna Pratui had been called to investigate a woman that had been bitten at a local flour mill. Noting cordyceps in her report, cutting into the corpse's bite wound produced a nightmarish vision of fungal threads within the body as tendrils of living mycelium protruded from the corpse's mouth slowly. The inside of the body had been replaced by fungus. 14 other bite victims had escaped the scene of the original attacks and were reported missing. Nobody knew where they went, prompting Dr. Pertui to say that the entire city needed to be bombed. There is no cure, no prevention, no vaccine. Only military hellfire could stop what was about to come. But even from there, the world food supply would have already been widely distributed, running from multitudes of consumable goods from Indonesia. As stated by Joel in his hypothesis to Ellie, There were certain brands of food that were sold everywhere, all across the country, across the world. You eat enough of it, it'll get you infected. So the tainted food all hits the store shelves around the same time Thursday. Ate some Thursday night or Friday morning. They started to get sick. Evening, they got worse. Then they started biting. And by Monday, everything was gone. Causing sudden chaos in the streets as family, loved ones, strangers, people of all creeds suddenly becoming mindlessly violent and bite anyone they can get their hands on. All traffic will come to a halt. All emergency response systems will be flooded with calls. Planes dropping from the skies like flies. Cars crashing into buildings. People unarmed officials to attacking on one another not knowing who is a stark raving lunatic or not. Any number of things can claim your life on that first night of the Cordyceps outbreak. Now, once you or someone else has 
has consumed a product with that tainted flower, or once you have been bitten by an infected individual, symptoms will start to arise depending on the amount consumed or the location of the bite on your body. Time to full infection tables include bites to the leg and foot taking between 12 to 24 hours, bites on the torso, arm, shoulder, or hands between 2 to 8, and the neck, face, and head only up to about 15 minutes. Basically, meaning the closer the bite to your brain, the faster the cordyceps can fully infect you. From there, signs of the cordyceps infection can include coughing, slurred speech, muscle spasms, and drastic mood swings or mood change. As symptoms worsen, they will be harder to conceal for those focused on self-preservation, but eventually full infection will take over, leading to someone ravenously trying to bite others with a new twist. Now, the bites in this particular zombie, or zombie-like apocalypse, are different. Instead of it being just a viral infection that gets to the brain of a victim, tendrils of the ophiocordyceps will instead leach from the mouth of the infected to invade the body of a person through a bite wound. The mycelium hastily travels through the bloodstream as it hijacks the nervous system completely and overrides the brain to do one thing and one thing only, spread the fungus to susceptible hosts as much as possible. This will be the maximum capability of this variation of the cordyceps brain infection. Yet even without the potential for airborne spores that we will discuss soon, it was still able to cripple the entire planet's population of people in a very short amount of time. But the fungus is able to burrow into the brain and take control irreversibly. There is no coming back. Upon fully succumbing to the cordyceps' influence, you will become what is known as a runner. Much like the 28 Days Later brand of zombies. Uh, infected. What the fu- Wow! These infected individuals will relentlessly run at an individual at the highest speed their body will allow, attempting only to fight, bite, and congregate. As the host body lives its life attempting to assault and sink its teeth and tendril-filled mouth into healthy people, the fungi itself will slowly devour the body from within, replacing anything it consumes with strings of white mycelium in order to keep the body alive as long as possible, meaning any infected personnel, no matter their condition, as a healthy person in their past life will suddenly be able to shake off their disabilities and health problems in a short amount of time to become a deadly spreader as seen with the disabled grandmother going from a disabled wheelchair bound individual and deaf not being able to hear anything to suddenly running at high speeds through houses and going after just the slightest sound with no issue. Even children will acquire wild bounds of strength and speed to overwhelm fully grown adults. Many people would hesitate to fight back to a degree that would fatally wound an infected child, leading to either their own infection or death via mauling. The cordyceps doing so allows the body to do more while withstanding more damage as critical organs are slowly replaced by by this mycelium. Compounded with no sense of pain, this can leave the infected extremely hard to kill. Think like a hollowed out puppet with maximized potential with the only thing omitted is basic intelligence skills. Now there are two routes the cordyceps can take with the host body over time depending on how well utilized it is and how it manages to last. If a body is able to live long enough with this parasitic host, then it will develop and evolve to coexist with the growth and mutations the cordyceps forces upon it, causing tendrils to protrude from the flesh, plates of mushroom caps popping up all over the body, and the cordyceps itself slowly enveloping the head with chitin-like fungal armor, effectively making these zombies tougher and harder to kill while also making them more blind as the cordyceps takes over more of their head, some eventually turning into what are known as the iconic clickers, completely blinded by the fungal chitin plumed from their head, causing them to rely on on echolocation and sound like a bat to find their prey, named after the distinctive clicking they make as they meander about. Their hardened flesh, even to their head, is durable enough to even withstand a few gunshots directly to the cranium. Now, if one of these guys latches onto you, it can easily rip out your flesh with its teeth or maul you to death in seconds flat. Their strength is really inhuman. One wrong sound and their shrill screams will be deafening you as you try to fend off this lunatic creature, just as much as the screech will alert other nearby clickers and runners to converge on your location. Now, if even more 
more time is allowed, then mutations of the body will reach biological critical mass as the fungal overgrowth turns the body into a hulking figure known as the bloater. Taking up to 15 to 20 years, a body can develop voraciously into this tank-like persona. With the body fully adorned with the chitin-like armor and pounds of flesh mounted all over, damaging this behemoth of a former human is nigh impossible by conventional methods, resisting much heavy ammunition and impossible to harm via methods not involving firepower or heavy amounts of fire itself. Due to rampant cellular mutation, the bloater has adapted muscle mass to give him superhuman strength, enough to easily knock out people in one punch and tear the head off a fully grown adult with one pull. If it draws close enough to you, outrunning it will be out of the equation as it grabs hold and suddenly the answer to what comes after death will be made perfectly clear to you in seconds flat. This supposed final form of the infection seeks not to infect, but outright kill anything it approaches, possibly due to the cordyceps within it deeming infection not necessary due to this fungal form's peak male performance. Or female, can't really tell under all that flesh, but it is in peak physical condition nonetheless. They are often seen amongst masses of infected to be in the charge against healthy hosts as they emerge from underneath the ground. So even fighting this perfect creature will be difficult as hundreds of infected will be acting as infantry for it to overwhelm you as it plays with your body like a ragdoll. Now, for a majority of the tainted populace, most will never never see themselves become these abominations of nature, although technically neither will clickers, as most will only live and function for about one or two months after infection. And if the cordyceps deems a body unable to make these mutations, it will cause it to be unable to move or function to a degree that the fungus can no longer spread its influence through direct means, allowing the body to decompose and die, allowing the fungus to consume it over time, causing the mycelium it has accumulated inside and outside the body to plume outwards completely and cling to nearby surfaces. This will be done frequently amongst large numbers of the infected as they will tend to gather in piles and slowly deteriorate to allow the fungus to grow and completely consume their flesh and fuse together to create giant nests nests of the cordyceps fungus to congregate over. This grotesque but simple act does display the fact that all of the infected share some kind of a rudimentary hive mind-like intelligence to work towards a common goal. While they can congregate to fuse their body puppet's flesh, they can also alert one another to a prey's presence. When one unit is alerted via sight, sound, or basic stimulation, when a unit is killed near ground, or even when simply stepping on a surface where the fungi has grown, the cordyceps fungus will relay signals up to a mile long through underground networks of its mycelium to alert other infected in that radial area to converge on the location to maximize their killing and infected capabilities. That means you don't know if this natural wired signal has been relayed at any moment and if this horde is going to be coming after you. They will also tend to assemble in dark and wet places like sewers and underground tunnel systems where they can allow the fungus to expand and mutate to a more hellish degree. If they are disturbed below or they detect healthy human activity above, they can eventually break through surfaces if given the chance over time. This was seen in Kansas City when a truck crashed through a house that had a weakened foundation by the cordyceps infected influence underneath meaning in large city areas with tunnel systems or even moderately sized sewers, the infected could eventually ambush you and your settlement from underneath, leaving you unaware and defenseless as everyone is mauled, ripped apart, and infected. An area lacking sunlight with adequate moisture day round would only serve to boost infected strength, durability, and numbers. 
The horde that emerged from underground was predominantly clickers that had mutated underneath, but we also had plenty of runners, all charging the forefront for the bloaters. As seen in their huddled masses, it seems they avoid areas with direct sunlight, so underground areas would leave most units to mutate into clickers and some to even bloaters with their own superhuman capabilities. Think like the locusts of Gears of War. The enemy could be right underneath your feet in an area where you can't see their point of emergence, but can eventually break through even the sturdiest of surfaces. They will come by the droves to swarm and annihilate whatever groups and factions lie above. Even in the most fortified of safe havens, they can attack from within, infecting the populace and staving off and whittling down the remnants of mankind. In the original Last of Us's Cordyceps brain infection, bodies that sat and decayed to become mushroom food would eventually produce airborne spores that, when inhaled, would breed and multiply in a host body. This is the case for the real-life form of the Cordyceps that infects ants. However, within this cinematic universe, those airborne spores are non-existent, and it's safe to say will never be factored into an eventuality equation. So there aren't super infected that explode fungus? spores on you? Shit, I hope not. <laughs> Considering 20 years into this outbreak, the corpses plastered to walls have produced none of these infectious particles. While I considered the advent of airborne spores to be the most deadly factor of the original fungus, seeing as how just breathing in the wrong location would mean your demise, this time around, being much more of a coordinated assemblage of infected makes for a more brutal, by-the-numbers affair rather than one of biological warfare. It is sufficient to say for once with the zombie apocalypse that the start of an outbreak's sheer numbers in a short amount of time would be the heaviest determining factor. Due to the severity of this pandemic and how sweeping its first day is, armed officials would desperately try and evacuate as much as possible. But with infection rates exponentially climbing, supplies being constricted, and testing for signs of the infection being more difficult with the higher numbers, drastic measures would have to be taken, no matter how immoral or reprehensible. Innocents who were escorted by army and government entities would most likely be taken to camps, and if there isn't enough room, or they deem you as a threat for any reason can execute you on the spot. Safe havens from then on out would test for signs of infection as a necessary precaution and, if positive, even down to a child would have to be exterminated via gun or lethal injection and then have their bodies burned. One infection can lead to many in a short amount of time with this brain infection. No half measures will be taken. Anyone not complying with the laws and regulations of whatever group, whether it be government or non-government entities, will simply be taken out to avoid disorder. Because, just like any other zombie or zombie like apocalypse, other healthy human beings will be a threat to your everyday survival. From leadership imposing its will for the greater good of the masses, to scavengers looking to get whatever they can, to rioters and anarchists doing whatever they want to whoever they want, people will do what they feel necessary to prop up their and or their loved one's own survival and needs above others. Now, when it comes to the why you wouldn't survive scenario of this outside the human elements, you would have to be of a lucky few that didn't partake in any flour or wheat products in the day of or day before the outbreak to not be a part of the giant sleeper cell of the infected population. In that first day, you will also have to avoid being gunned down by panicked civilians and armed officials, run over by fearful drivers escaping the chaos, being caught in bomb and fire attacks trying to limit the spread of the pandemic by the army or being bitten by the ever-expanding fungi army of which anyone you know could turn at any moment. And all of this is just in the first 12 to 24 hours, day one of the Cordyceps outbreak. As time marches on, the toll of a lawless land full of infected food supplies and people could come at a great cost and dampen your chances of survival. You would have to not be exterminated by government forces, find yourself either either in your own fortified home compounds like Bill or in quarantine camps ruled by nervous
nervous governmental and armed forces or rebellious groups looking to get revenge. Raiders looking to procure any supplies they can through violent methods, slavers looking to imprison others for various reasons, and so many more factions of people that could either work with you or work against your chances of survival. Who's to say in whatever safe haven you find yourself in that supplies will last? What will happen when they run dry? Will you fight? Will you die? Will you attempt to escape and be tried for it? Will revolution and new leadership lead to your execution? The human aspect of what can happen to you is truly unpredictable. Don't expect the love of your life to just fall into a hole and for the both of you to live mostly peacefully for the next decade eating chicken dinners and strawberries. Don't expect someone and his little brother to appear to show you the way out of a militarized zone, or for someone with survival skills to show up and show you the way. You'll have to maintain steady supplies of food, water, medicine, weapons, and keep yourself sane and coordinate with others you can hopefully trust all while trying to do so while the infected numbers rise. The Cordyceps infected will all develop in ways that make long-term survival difficult, evolving to create chitin-like flesh to withstand more trauma and some transforming into clickers and bloaters to be monstrous and seemingly unkillable beasts. Anything can adapt to become stronger even if the person that becomes infected was feeble and immobile beforehand. All of these infected are able to survive long periods of time due to the fungus altering the body composition through mycelium, meaning the method of just waiting for all of them to rot is never going to happen. Now, for those that do seemingly drop and rot and don't become a threat anymore, their flesh will be nothing more than fungus food used to create fungal networks underneath your feet for the cordyceps to relay signals long distances to active and inactive infected to swarm you at a moment's notice if you are not careful where you step or who you alert. You would have to somehow avoid being bitten each and every day and make sure the underground network of fungus doesn't find its way into crops you grow and eat. Remember, this all started from wheat crops, so depending on what you're growing and how it's going, it might adapt to even go into other animals and livestock or any kind of plants that you are growing. If within a town, you must make sure the cordyceps infected aren't biding their time and harvesting their masses to be an unstoppable force when unearthed. Otherwise, you or someone nearby could be infected via consumption or bite. Now, we do have to discuss that there is a lottery level chance that you and your anatomy may have the exact makeup, like Ellie, that the cordyceps cannot spread its infection within your body and cause you to turn in any amount of time. You could be immune, but I'm telling you right now, you just aren't built different. I'm telling you that with 100% certainty. Ellie was born into the world that had already been long consumed by the cordyceps six years in. So it's very possible she was able to develop an immunity to it because of prenatal disposition to the fungus. And you are not going to be immune. And even if you are, Tess said it pretty well herself that you are not immune to being beaten to death. Now, if you want to test the genetic lottery and see if you are immune, well, go right ahead. I won't stop you. But if you do get bit, you're going to be a bona fide fungus puppet in a day max. The only way, as discussed before by Dr. Pertui, is to bomb the ever-living hell out of any place that even has a trace of either infected people or cordyceps-ridden products. Fire is the only cure. If that could be achieved in a very small time window at the very onset of its origin point, it is possible to stop, but those chances are very slim. It'll most likely not happen either due to hesitation of immorally wiping out human life at the idea of a virus or fungus being so virulent, or that we would have protests at the idea of such heinous acts being committed and slowing progress at eradicating this fungi, or facilities housing the necessary weapons to do so being overrun before anything legitimate can be done. In all avenues of simulations, in most scenarios, much like Doctor Strange looking through every universe, the way this fungus spreads discreetly before it's too late to stop it would cause the world, dominated by sentient humans, to plummet into what is The Last of Us. These infected, the cordyceps, will never die off. 
it will only become stronger with their units becoming more agile, strengthened, some more extreme in certain senses, ever pervasive in being unkillable, and those that do die off feeding a hive mind in the earth below that will allow them to communicate and bind together to easily pick off what is left of us while humanity in its fractured state fights for leadership, survival, and in a total state of perpetual fear weakening us day by day. The Cordyceps brain infection will never wane, looking to infect more and more until there is none of us. That about wraps up this double dip look into the parallel universe of The Last of Us on HBO and how differently things developed for the Cordyceps brain infection from its video game counterpart. Hopefully this revamp satisfied your hunger. Coming soon, I'll be going through the series thoroughly in a giant Zombie Sins video covering the entire first season. Sorry for the long delay since the last video. I've been going through some stuff, but hopefully we can get vid weekly videos or bi-weekly videos back to you soon. You can help the channel get back on its feet by being a patron on my Patreon or a member of my YouTube channel by joining or going to my Patreon to be featured as one of these fine people on this list here. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, I'm Zach Cass, aka Wild Gaming. Stay happy, stay healthy, and never forget to stay wild.